Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers. Uh, welcome to this session of the Islam Study Circle. Uh, we are resuming after the winter break, and I hope you have enjoyed your time with your relatives. Uh, we'll start off with the Quranic verse, uh, which you can see uh, in front of your screens. And uh, it is a very famous verse of the Quran, and we know that it is uh, also called as the Ayatul Kursi. Uh, this verse actually introduces the person of God, and uh, let me read out the text before you. And once uh, you've been introduced to the text, I'll translate the text, and then we can proceed from here. So the words are, Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyu al qayyum, la ta'khuzuhu sinatun wa la naum, lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard, man zallazi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'izni, ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum, وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ إِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ وَسِيَا كُرْسِيُهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَعُودَهُ حِفْزُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَذِينَ So this is verse 255 of Surah Baqarah. A uh, translation of this verse would be, God, there is no other deity but He. The living, the sustainer, neither slumber nor sleep overtakes Him. All that is in the heavens and the earth belongs to Him. Who can intercede with him for someone except by his permission? He knows what lies before them and what is after them. And without his will, they cannot grasp any part of his knowledge. His dominion prevails in the heavens and the earth, and the protection does not fatigue him. And he is the exalted, the great one. So, uh, viewers, you can see uh, that these, uh, this, uh, this is uh, one of the longer verses of the Quran, and uh, it introduces the person of God and the way he has been described uh, in the Quran. Of course, there are many instances in which he has been described, but this is a particular area or a particular instance uh, in the Quran in which this description has taken a fair amount of detail. So the first thing which is, uh, of course, uh, expressed here is the belief of monotheism or Tawheed. And we must remember that in those times when the Quran was being revealed, Paganism and idolatry, polytheism, were the rampant creed amongst Arabia. And the idolaters of Mecca, they had, as we all know, uh, been involved for centuries in worshipping uh, idols and uh, various deities that they had set up for themselves. And to them, the mention of a new god was an absolute anathema. And the fact that he was one single god was even more of a, more of a uh, crime in their eyes and therefore they took to task any person who would mention that there is only one god to them god was of course that uh, the god which they believed was one but for them to reach that god they had created many demigods and many smaller deities about which uh, they would say that they worship them in order to reach the supreme god so this uh, whole uh, falsification and this is something which we can clearly see is found in the Quran and the verse of the throne as you can see is a very very important verse of the Quran which tells us that foremost that we need to understand that there is no God except God and today when we utter these words of course this is something uh, which is a very common thing or which is something which we realize it's uh, is its importance or maybe uh, under stress its importance but uh, let us uh, Imagine the time in which this verse was being revealed, uh, expressing the uh, monothe uh, expressing the belief of monotheism, or expressing the fact that God is one, uh, was a huge, huge uh, claim, and it was actually uh, welcomed with onslaughts, with attacks, with a lot of jeers, and ultimately we know that the idolaters uh, went after the lives of the prophet and his companions. So. Uh, this stress has to be understood if we have to uh, understand the real importance of this world. And let me take this opportunity to also uh, brief you of the fact that uh, in all of the Quran, this belief of monotheism, which is so understood today to us because of the fact that all of us are monotheists, uh, and especially I'm talking about the Abrahamic uh, followers, uh, religion of Abraham, all of them are so used to the, the creed of monotheism that they, when they see the mention and the stress of uh, monotheism uh, in the scriptures, they at times uh, uh, are not connecting to the fact 
that this was a time when monotheism was a very, very alien thing into society. And hence, the reason that the Quran has stressed it over and over again in so many surahs, in so many ways, is because of the fact that this monotheism, this creed of monotheism needed to uh, have currency in the land of Arabia and it needed its implementation at, and its recognition uh, amongst people. So that is why we find that the belief of monotheism is uh, talked about so much in the Quran. It's, it's, it's the, one of the very, very prominent themes of the Quran. Every couple of verses down, it is discussed. So in order to grasp the importance of this uh, fact, we need to understand the time in which this uh, this this whole uh, Quran, the way it is presenting the creed of Tawheed, uh, was being revealed. The second thing which the verse of the throne says, La sinatum wala naum, that slumber or sleep does not overtake him, which in other words means that he is vigilant. He is watching over ourselves. He knows what we are doing. None of us can escape him. And hence, we need to understand that we have to feel that we are going to be answerable to him for every one, or every one of our deeds. And this is a thing that might uh, be of another uh, very important uh, aspect that we must realize, that if we are given this uh, feeling that there is a time uh, in this universe or in this whole setup that the Almighty is not watching us, I think that all of us would be the ones who would take lead in uh, violating laws and in disobeying the Almighty the most, even if it's for a couple of moments. So it, the point made or the point is being made here is that the Almighty is always watching over his creatures. There's not a single instant in which we can think that he is not watching over us to give us his his feeling, uh, this, this all embracing feeling that we are being watched by the eyes of the Almighty, by his angels, and whatever we do, whatever we think, whatever we intend is in his knowledge. And we must not think that there is a time anywhere, anytime that he is not uh, overlooking and watching us. Or he's not looking upon us. The second, uh, the third thing, uh, which of course, uh, this verse of the throne stresses is, Lahu ma fis samawati wa ma fil ard. Man illa bi izni. So, this is expressing the knowledge of the Almighty, that everything which is in the heavens and the earth belongs to him. And there is no one uh, who can in intercede for someone except by his permission. Of course, uh, the, the, the whole concept of intercession has been erroneously uh, subjected to a lot of erroneous interpretations. And I would say that as far as the uh, belief of uh, intercession is concerned, uh, the Quran has made very clear, unequivocally clear, that intercession is not, is not going to make anything which is the requirement of justice uh, to be falsified. The requirements of justice shall be taken, shall be granted, shall be implemented. It is only in, in cases when, for example, the deeds of a person are even Stevens, maybe his good deeds and his bad deeds are equal in number, that perhaps uh, as in order to uh, give honor to various prophets, including the Prophet Muhammad, it will be asked that if God should forgive such people. And uh, of course, uh, as has been said at various places, that the person for whom this intercession will be called will be appointed by the Almighty. The person for whom and the person who is appointed for the, this intercession will also be someone which the Almighty chooses. And whatever he will say will never be against the truth. So all these conditions tell us that Intercession is basically a prayer which is or a supplication which is made by the Prophet. And uh, uh, if it has to be made, then it is merely going to be a supplementary or a, or a thing of uh, honor for that Prophet so that he can exercise his honor by simply saying, OK, we can forgive him. So again, here the point that is being made is that uh, no one can intercede in the, uh, in, in the presence of the Almighty except and he uh, unless he allows them and by his permission. So the words are, illa bi iznihi. And then the verse goes on to say, uh, that he knows what is behind them. He, he knows what is in front of them, which means that he has awareness of the past and the future. And therefore, he has uh, his knowledge is never impaired so that people need to fulfill it or need to add to it so that he is able to take account of people because of this supplementary knowledge supplied. 
So uh, he it, it, it further says, "Wala yuhitu na bishayim min ilmihi illa bimasha," and that he knows what lies. Of course, this, this is the previous part. Uh, and without his knowledge, they cannot grasp any part of his knowledge. So without his will, actually. Uh, without the will of the Almighty, without the consent of the Almighty, they cannot grasp any part of his knowledge. So it's it's like saying that all knowledge is gifted to us by the Almighty. And if we are able to, to t- take account of any part of that knowledge, it is because the Almighty has given this permission. And then it says, Wasiya Kursiyu Samawati Wal Ard, that his dominion prevails in the heavens and the earth. That his sovereignty prevails in the heavens and the earth. Whatever is there is under his control. He is governing the affairs, and no one should have this misconception that there are other deities or there are other uh, gods or idols who are helping him out. So you can see clearly that this verse of the throne is is giving stock of the fact that the Almighty is uh, the single controller. He has a single. In, he's the single intended, a single governor. Of this whole universe there is no one who is helping him out in any way and if there is uh, this claim made by anyone then they should produce the proof of this claim which of course the Quran always uh, has said at various instances and then you see it says and that their protection is the protection of his dominion does not fatigue him uh, and of course, this is a veiled reference to what is found in one of the older books or, or the older scriptures in which it says that the Almighty uh, felt tired on the, after the creation of the universe and he rested uh, on the Sabbath of the seventh day. So the Quran absolutely negates this uh, notion. It says that the protection of his dominion does not fatigue him and he is the exalted, the great one. So in a nutshell, you can clearly see the the glory and the majesty of this uh, verse of the throne, the way it addresses the belief of monotheism in such a comprehensive way, in such a uh, all-embracing way, so that uh, we, in all our thinking, in all our uh, interpretations, are not able to deviate the slightest. And this is uh, one of the greatest expressions of monotheism. And if you take uh, the uh, the content of Surah Ikhlas or Surah Ahad, the third last surah of the Quran, which every Muslim boy or girl learns by heart in, in the very first step of his or her life. Uh, this, Along with this verse of the throne, we can clearly see that the person of God is introduced to us in, as a person, as a, as a being who takes care, takes care of us because, uh, as we know, he is watching over us. He is granting us this dominion, if he, a part of his dominion, a part of the, the sovereignty as a trust. And hence, we need to understand that this is something uh, which we must always take care of and we must always regard to be a primary uh, consideration. So we will now uh, we go on to the next step of our uh, study circle. And this is uh, the hadith of the day that we are going to discuss. Uh, I'm going to read out the words of this hadith. Uh, this hadith is taken uh, from Al Jami al Sahih of Imam Bukhari. And the words are An Abi Sayyid al Khudri, Rajullahu ta'ala anhu, Inna nasam in al Ansar, Sa'alu Rasulullah, his lahu ever sellem, Fa'artahum, Summa Sa'uluhu Fa'artahum, Hatta Nafidama in the Hu, Fakal, Mayakunu in the Min Khairin Falan, Addahirahu in Ankum. وَمَنْ يَسْتَعْفِفْ يُعْفَهُ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَسْتَغْنِي يُغْنِهِ اللَّهُ وَمَنْ يَسْتَسَبَّرْ يُسَبِّرُ اللَّهُ وَمَا أُوْتِيَا أَحَدٌ عَتَاءً خَيْرٍ وَأَوْسَعَا مِنَ الصَّبْرِ So another very, very thought-provoking narrative of the Prophet. It says, Abu Sayyid al-Khudri reported, some people from the Ansar asked for charity from God's messenger. So he gave it to them. They again asked and he again obliged until he was left with nothing. So he kept on giving whatever he had at every instance. So he said, whatever is with me of wealth, I did not withhold from you. So he who wants to become chaste, God will make him chaste. And he who showed contentment, God will grant him wealth. And he who asks for patience from God, God will grant him patience. And no person can be given a grant better and bigger than patience. So these last words are so uh, thought-provoking and they are so uh, 
moving. So the greatest gift which God can give to a person is the gift of patience. This is how the narrative ends. But before that, you can clearly see that uh, the Ansar were asking for charity from the Prophet and he kept on obliging and until a time when he was left for nothing. And then as if advising them and counseling them is also part of this charitable behavior, the Prophet said, that a person who would like to remain chaste, a person who would like to remain modest, a person who would like to restrain himself, discipline himself, sexual, sexual and sexual matters, the Almighty will help him out. So it's, it's, it's like saying that if a person is not married maybe, or even if he is married, and he would still like to confine himself to his spouse, and before his marriage he would not uh, let his thoughts waver and succumb to them and indulge into indecent acts, this particular narrative says that if he asks this from the Almighty, the Almighty will grant him this. So the words are, so he who wants to become chaste, God will make him chaste. And then, uh, viewers, you can see that the narrative goes on and it says that he who showed contentment, God will grant him wealth. So a person who has this uh, air of contentment in him, he's not greedy. He's not after gathering all sorts of wealth and amassing riches. The Almighty says contentment is the key to wealth. So if he or she decides to remain content, the Almighty will actually provide him or her with wealth, which actually is a sign and a signal to us that instead of running after wealth and riches all the times, of course, our needs are there and this does not at all discourage us uh, from uh, indulging in acquiring wealth. But uh, the point that is being made here is that contentment is something that should also be watched a person should remain content and satisfied after a certain point of time in which he or she thinks that his or her present and future needs are being fulfilled, whether personal or private or business needs, they are being fulfilled. So whatever else he or she gathers uh, is something which he or she always considers as a bonus. And uh, it does not matter him or to him or her uh, what else that they have and they, they, they readily and give it in the, in the, to the path of the Almighty and all such tasks. So it says that God will grant him wealth if he decides to remain content. And then viewers, you can clearly see the final uh, closing uh, part of this uh, beautiful narrative, which tells us that we should create these traits in us. It says that a person who decides to remain patient and he asks for the Almighty to grant him this gift of patience, the Almighty will grant him this gift. And then the words are, there is no better and bigger a gift than the gift of patience. And I think we all agree that the biggest challenge of life that we face is how we behave when troubles come our way, is how we behave when we are faced with straightened circumstances. The only way out is to show trust in God. The only way out is to think that the Almighty is trying and testing us in order to provide us the opportunity to show patience and gain even more reward. It, he is providing, providing us with an opportunity to come closer to him. So the closer we become in these circumstances, the better the chance that we stand in coming closer to him and in being rewarded by him. So viewers, you can clearly see that the the, the gift of patience, which this narrative uh, stresses upon us, is one of the greatest gifts. I'm sure we all agree. And as I said, that the life in which we pass and the troubles and the botherations through which we pass are such that these at times really bog us down. At times they frustrate us. At times they make us think that maybe the Almighty has left us. At times they make us realize that uh, there is nothing left in life. But it is here that we have to show patience. And as has been said here, and that if a person prays for patience, the Almighty will grant him patience. And at another place in the Quran, it is said that paradise is nothing but a reward for patience. It says, Bajazahum bima sabaru jannatan wa harira. So basically, it's the patience that is being rewarded when you get uh, admitted into paradise. And then at another place, the Quran also says, Wama sabruka illa billah. Wama sabruka illa billah, which means that. Patience can only be exercised by the help of God, which in other words means that if we have to be patient, if we have to exercise patience, it has to be uh, 
it's, it's, it has to be a struggle. Of course, if we struggle, if we uh, put in an effort, the Almighty will uh, fill up that gap. He will help us in uh, not succumbing to our uh, follies and not succumbing, succumbing to the fact that uh, there is no one, uh, this, this uh, ill hope that there's no one to take care of us. We'll not succumb to these bad thoughts. And as I said, that patience is one of the greatest gifts of the Almighty. And also patience is the door to wisdom. This also has been expressed at some places in the Quran that if you have to become a wise person, if you have to become a person who has to, who goes deep down into the into issues of life and he would like to solve some of the these issues or get to the bottom of them, then it says that it's basically patience which takes us there. And uh, it's said that when you tell hikmata, uh, a person who is given this wisdom, he is actually blessed with a great treasure. So the treasure of wisdom, perhaps, is the greatest treasure that we can amass, that we can gather, and we can use for ourselves, because it is the key to a lot of things. The patience that we have, the perseverance that we exercise, the, set, the steadfastness that we exhibit, they are the jewels of human behavior. They are the crowns of uh, human behavior, because this is religion is nothing but showing patience and trust in the Almighty, controlling ourselves, controlling our desires, and let not letting them being overcome. We are not letting ourselves being overcome by them. So what we need to understand is that these are the traits and these are the qualities which the Almighty uh, produces on all in all those people who pray to Him that they be granted these these uh, traits. As you can see from this narrative that we are discussing that the almighty actually wants us to pray to him in order to grant us these features and these traits and these noble attributes so supplication dua as we say is the key here if we want to have patience if to we have to remain chaste in our life if we want to acquire any good trait then of course we have to make that effort in order to exercise it and at the same time if we pray to the Almighty to grant us this power to overcome our desires and to grant us this power to fulfill our own commitments, then it has to be this, uh, this self-motivation uh, and this self-fulfillment which the Almighty will grant in us if we uh, keep on continuing in this task. So viewers, this is the second part of our study circle. And let us now come to the third part, uh, which of course is the Bible verse of the day. The Bible verse of the day, which I have today chosen, <clears throat> actually, is from the Gospel of St. Matthew. And these are, in fact, three verses, and chapter 11 and verses 28 to 30. And I have entitled them as the yoke of God. So the words are, come to me, all you who are troubled and weighted down with care, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and become like me. For I am gentle and without pride, and you will have rest for your souls, for my yoke is good, and the weight I take up is not hard. So it seems here that the prophet Jesus is inviting people to embrace the yoke of God, and is telling them that if they come to him with this intention, that they'll become subservient and obedient to none other than the Almighty, none other than the Almighty, then this is something which is the real key, which can really and as, as the word says, as the verses say at the end, work is good and the weight I take out hard, then subservience to the Almighty is something which will always bring benefit to all of us. Subservience and obedience to the Almighty will, which will never let us down. It, was, it will make us realize our true and the lone creator and he is the governor of this universe. And we are humble human beings who need to submit to him at all costs. So uh, we need to understand that as far as uh, discussing the, this Bible verse is concerned, this is uh, a, a verse in which uh, the... ...basically belief... which gives us this confidence that we are answerable to accept him, that we are people who are going to express whatever we have, desires that we have, whatever needs that we have, whatever problems that we have before the Almighty, 
and to no one else. And as it is said, that they have to be told that it is the yoke of the Almighty, which is the real yoke. It is the yoke of the Almighty, which does not have except on the person himself. He has to understand this, that in all such cases, it is the Almighty who is to be uh, addressed. It is the Almighty who has to be turned to, and uh, all other supports things are there, are in fact not there. And therefore, uh, the, we had to understand Commitment to the Almighty is something which will only fulfill the, the uh, attitude or is befitting for our attitude if it is done in the fitness of things. So, viewers, this is, uh, this is how uh, we uh, have uh, come to the, to the first part of this uh, study in which we have discussed a couple of verses of the Quran, discussed a hadith, been able to discuss a couple of verses, and as I said, this is from. The Gospel of St. Matthew, and this is chapter 11, verse 8 and 30. Uh, to our next part, uh, if, we, if you have any questions regarding this particular uh, segment, uh, kindly raise your hands and let me know if I can just unmute your mic. So uh, I can see you, Fahad. Okay, I'm going to unmute your mic. Uh, Dr. Shazad, I just want to say that the voice has been going in and out. We have not been able to hear you clearly at times. Your voice keeps going in and out. So just wanted to okay. let you know. Okay, so is the problem with the connection? I don't think so. It just sometimes it gets blurred. Your voice gets like uh, blurred, blurred up, or you know, then we can't hear you a word or two or three. And then it comes back. I don't know, uh, but if other people are having the same issue, too, but okay. I'm having this uh, problem. Okay. So uh, is it now okay to hear now? Yeah, there is still some some disturbance, but I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, it's better now. Okay. Thank you. I'm not in residence. I'm traveling like the. Okay, maybe that's why. Yeah, because it, it went off again. So uh, if you don't have so I let me just uh, uh, go on to the next part and uh, we in this part we generally discuss uh, common misconception um, and uh, <clears throat> misconception I have to discuss the uh, issues that we have already discussed earlier and that is the issue of intercession. Now the issue Intercession is something which uh, Muslims uh, think for them that the Almighty has made this arrangement that at the uh, intercession of the Prophet on the final day of judgment, all paradise, the uh, Prophet would pray for them and seek forgiveness for them. And whoever, uh, for whichever person uh, the, the Prophet actually seeks forgiveness, he will be that person will be forgiven. By the Almighty. That fact that the is that we have uh, the, the, the way to do that is that we have become closer to the Prophet and request him. That uh, he is the person that who is going to have uh, something of our uh, the Almighty. So, <clears throat> uh, that as far as intercession is concerned, verse of which we just started, it says that no one can intercede. No one can intercede. It just includes all prophets of God before Him without His permission. And at instances in the Quran, it is said that for whom the permission is also 
the prerogative of the Almighty. It is he who is going to choose who is going to intercede for whom. And uh, the fact is that whatever is going to be said is not going to make any sort of things come about. So the words in Surah al Naba are Wakala Sawaba. Whatever will be said will be based on the entire truth and injust justice will not be uh, nullified in any way. And makes us realize that as far as intercession is concerned, it's nothing more than a prayer by a prophet of God regarding certain people who might be having equal deeds, good and bad. And he had already decided, the Almighty has already decided to forgive in order to honor certain prophets of God, in order to honor his prophets of God, he asked them, should I, like saying that uh, in his own mind, he has already actually made up his mind to forgive a certain person, and he's only asking the prophet to bestow honor on him. And hence, we need to realize that as far as uh, this intercession is concerned, it, it is a gravely misunderstood uh, belief, and we always think that it is basically intercession which is going to save every Muslim on the day of judgment. And hence, if in the intercession of Prophet Muhammad, that is all that they need to do. So we need to understand that this is not the case. The Quran is absolutely against it. On the contrary, look, what the Quran stresses is Laysa lil insani illa masa, which means that the person will only earn what he is himself did. No one is going to add or subtract or be able to. Of any benefit. In fact, at other instances, the closest of relatives will have no, absolutely no benefit for their own relatives. The closest of them includes wives, children, spouses, parents, extended family. None 